All right, this morning, as you can see from the title on the board, we will be talking about a brief overview of the end times. An overview of the end times. This would be like an outline, really a very basic outline of the things that are yet to happen in the coming days, months and years. And the Bible, you see, is a history book, basically, and that's something that Christians need to understand. The Bible is primarily a history book. It's not a religious book. It is not a book with doctrines. It is not given to, uh, so that people could practice religion. The Bible is a history book. It records past, present and future history. And that's something that's very important for you to recognize. And the things that are written in the Bible about the past are true, about the present are true, and even the things that are going to happen uh, uh, that have been predicted in the Bible will come true and there is much evidence in the Bible for that in this overview of the end times we'll be looking basically at Matthew chapter 24 and 25 and we will be comparing it uh, these two chapters with Revelation chapter 6 and a few other parts um, of the book of Revelation so in this overview we are going to look at a basic outline as I've said of the things that are going to happen very soon things that shall come to pass very very soon the Lord willing in our lifetimes all right so please firstly turn to Matthew chapter 24 turn to Matthew chapter 24 and we'll read verse 3 and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So, because of this question that the apostles asked, the Lord Jesus Christ said the things that are recorded in Matthew 24 and Matthew 25. I want you to understand that Matthew 24 and 25 have nothing to do with the church age. These two chapters are completely to do with the tribulation, the tribulation period after the church is raptured. Now this is the rapture of the church. This is a timeline which will help us to better understand the things that shall come to pass. And this is the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. The second advent the second coming before the things that are written in Matthew 24 and 25 come to pass there is another event that the Bible very clearly talks about turn with me to 1st Thessalonians chapter 4 1st Thessalonians chapter 4 and we'll read verses 13 onwards to the end of the chapter but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. There are some Christians, even in these days, very surprisingly, who believe that the church will not be raptured, but that the church will go through the tribulation and only meet the Lord Jesus Christ at the end of the tribulation. It's unbelievable that in spite of all uh, the in-depth study uh, that has been done on the subject of the rapture by various Bible teachers, there are some who are still ignorant on this subject. They think that this doctrine of the rapture has been invented by dispensational theologians, but it is something that is not uh, uh, found in the scriptures or it's something that has not been believed in by early Christians. Now that's all been proven to be completely false. 
We don't need the testimony of Christians or early Christians and we don't need to know whether they have believed it or not. We need to look into the scriptures and see what the Bible says. The Bible clearly distinguishes between the rapture of the church and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the rapture of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ comes into midair as we have just read in this passage. But at the second advent of uh, Christ, he comes down to the earth. The Bible is very clear about it and it separates these two events and the rapture is for the church, the body of Christ who have been uh, here in this church period. This is the church age. All the Christians of the church age were dead and living will be caught up at the rapture of the church. This is a very simple and basic doctrine that you need to learn and understand. Now this is not a, a new doctrine in the scriptures. The rapture is not something that's been uh, uh, mentioned for the first time in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now the word rapture is not there in the Bible. There's no doubt about that. But that doesn't mean the doctrine is not true and that the doctrine is not mentioned elsewhere in the scriptures. Let me show you very quickly that the Bible sure gives us at least seven raptures in the Bible. And I'm not going to go in detail and talk about each of these seven raptures, but I'm showing you these seven raptures just for you to understand that the doctrine of being caught up to meet the Lord in the air is not something new in the scriptures. The first person to be raptured in the Bible was Enoch. Enoch. In the book of Genesis chapter 5 and verse 24, we read this. Genesis 5 24 all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years uh, and then it goes on in verse 24 and Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him Enoch is a type of the church Enoch is a type of the church there are many Christians who believe that Enoch since he was caught up without dying will come back in the tribulation as one of the two, uh, two witnesses and will be martyred uh, for his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in the tribulation. Now that is false. That is absolutely false. Now the reason why most Christians believe that Enoch has to die because he never died uh, is because of what it says in Hebrews chapter 9 that it is appointed unto men once to die and after that the judgment. So they think that that verse in Hebrews 9 is saying that every human being has to die. If that is the case, what about Christians who will be raptured when Jesus comes into midair? They're, they're not going to die. Not everybody is going to die. So that tells you that that verse in Hebrews 9 is a general statement that ge people who are born generally have to die. But there are exceptions. And Enoch is an exception. And as I've said, he's a type of the church. And as a type of the church, Enoch, uh, Enoch is not going to die. He's not going to come back uh, in the tribulation as one of the two witnesses. Because he's a type of the church, he's never going to die. And he's gone up to be with the Lord forever. And that's an exceptional case, of course. So the first of the seven raptures is the rapture of Enoch. Enoch is a type of the church, as I've said, just as Noah is a type of Israel in the tribulation. Just as Noah and his family were saved in the ark in those, uh, from those great flood waters, the Lord is going to save Israel and take them through the tribulation and bring them out safe at the end of it. So these are two great types. Enoch is a type of the church. He is caught up before the flood. Noah is a type of uh, Israel and he goes through the flood. So those are two beautiful types in the Old Testament of the church and Israel. Then you have another person in the Old Testament who was raptured. Look at 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2. And we'll read verse 11. 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 11. And it came to pass as they still went on and talked, that behold there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So here you have in the Old Testament another 
rapture and this is the rapture of Elijah. The rapture of Elijah and Elijah again is a type of post-tribulation Jewish rapture. He's a type of a post-trib rapture. As you're going to see, there is a rapture towards the end of the tribulation and as we have been teaching in all our Bible studies. Then the third person to be caught up is found in Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1. And verse 9. Acts chapter 1 and verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. So the third person to be raptured in the scriptures is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The Lord Jesus Christ. He's taken up in their sight and a cloud received him out of their sight, it says. And then an angel says, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So just as he went up, he's going to come back one day. So Jesus Christ is the third rapture that you find in the Bible. Then the fourth one. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll read verses 2 to 4. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up. To and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. So the fourth person in this church age who was caught up was none other than the apostle to the Gentiles, the apostle Paul. The apostle Paul also was raptured. So I want you to understand that raptures in the Bible are not something new. It's not something that dispensationalists have created, uh, you know, to get around certain uh, difficulties in the Bible. No, that's not the case at all. There are many raptures mentioned in the Bible. We've already seen four of them. And the fifth rapture is the rapture of the church. And this you will find in Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 and in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 as we have already read verse 17. These are, uh, this is the rapture of the church before the tribulation begins. And then the sixth rapture that you find in the Bible is found in Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, we'll read verses 1 to 5. Verses 1 to 5. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And a child was caught up unto God, and to his throne. Now this rapture that we read about in Revelation chapter 12 takes place in the middle of the tribulation and it is very evident if you study the entire chapter. This is the rapture of the man-child. The rapture of the man-child which takes place exactly in the middle of the tribulation just before the great tribulation begins. Now most probably this could also be the time when the, the, the five virgins go to meet the Lord for the wedding. It could be around this time where five virgins are left behind, remember in Matthew chapter 25. But the other five who were ready, 
uh, go to meet the bridegroom. So this could be around the same time as the rapture of the man-child. Now the thing that you need to notice is that raptures in the Bible are not something new and the rapture of the church is not the only rapture that is mentioned in the Bible. The last rapture is to be found in Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 1. It says, And I looked and lo, a lamb stood up stood upon uh, on the Mount Zion and with him an hundred forty and four thousand having his father's name written in their foreheads. This is the rapture of the 144,000 Jewish virgins that are mentioned first in Revelation chapter 7. In Revelation 7, these 144,000 uh, Jewish male virgins are on the earth. But in Revelation chapter 14, you find they are with the Lamb on Mount Zion. And this Mount Zion is not Jerusalem. This Mount Zion is the heavenly Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, uh, which is um, in the third heaven. So these people are caught up to meet the Lord in the air sometime just before the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now it's very difficult to... Uh, to ascertain the exact time of this rapture because so many other things are involved and so far at least I could not correctly place the exact time of this post-tribulation rapture but it certainly is sometime towards the very end of the tribulation sometime very close to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ this is also the time when the two witnesses that would be Elijah and Moses Moses and Elijah not Enoch and Elijah no matter what you say there is enough proof in the Bible to say that these two witnesses are Moses and Elijah so they also will be caught up at this post tribulation rapture look at Revelation chapter 11 and verse 12 and they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them come up hither and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. This happens towards the end of the tribulation. The Antichrist overcomes them and kills them. And for three days, their bodies are there on the earth, and then they come back to life, and they are caught up in the eyes of, uh, you know, they're caught up before uh, all the people who hated them and who tried to kill them. So this is the seventh rapture that is found in the book of Revelation. Uh, if you go back to Revelation chapter 14 and go towards the end of that chapter, uh, in verse 16 it says, And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. This is a very clear reference to Gentile believers. Gentile believers who are also raptured sometime towards the end of the tribulation. So the point that I would like to make is that there are at least seven raptures mentioned in the Bible. So don't think for a moment that this rapture of the church that we are talking about is a new doctrine invented by dispensationalists. But the thing that you need to understand is that we are living right here very very close to the rapture of the church and the Bible calls these days last days last days last days is a reference to the last days of the church the last days of the Gentile church and look at what the condition of this uh, period would be in the scriptures look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 2 Timothy chapter 3 and we'll read verses 1 to 7 2 Timothy 3 1 to 7 this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come from here on till verse 7 Paul mentions 25 characteristics of people living in the last days and it's not a pretty picture that he paints look at verse 2 for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, 
despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For, if the, uh, for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now look at verse 13. Uh, verses 12 and 13. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, they have, the Bible has given a very clear uh, description of how people will become more and more wicked as we approach the rapture of the church. And he said that the things that you can expect, firstly, the first one is persecution. And this is the persecution of the church, which is already there throughout the world. The persecution of the church. The second thing he said is uh, that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Deception. And that's what we see already in this world. A great wave of deception has swept over the world, especially over the church. And the devil has succeeded in keeping millions of Christians in blindness and deception so that they would never see the truth of what God wants them to learn, not just about these last things, but about everything else, about their own selves, about what God's purpose for their lives is. They are unable to see any of these things because of this great delusion, this great deception that is there uh, on the earth among Christians in these last days. So the next great event in God's calendar is the rapture of the church. And the question is, are we ready to be raptured and to face the Lord Jesus Christ and stand before him? The thing is, every born again Christian will be raptured. There is no partial rapture taught in the Bible. It's a great misunderstanding of these other raptures that leads some Christians to think that only those Christians who live a holy life will be raptured before the tribulation and those who do not live a holy life will go through the tribulation, at least partly, and then they will be raptured later. You see, they completely confound the rapture of the church with the Jewish raptures mentioned uh, in the Bible. And because of that, they are totally confused. You should know this. Whether you are walking closely with the Lord or whether you are a backslidden Christian, you will be raptured when Jesus comes into midair. And the Bible says that the first thing that is going to happen after the rapture of the church is the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. And that's where every born-again Christian will appear. And at this judgment, our sins are not judged because our sins have been judged at Calvary. When Jesus died on the cross for our sins, when he shed his blood upon the cross, that's when our sins have been redeemed. But at the judgment seat of Christ, as you will read about it in the book of Romans and 1 Corinthians, our works are judged. What have we done for the Lord Jesus Christ as born-again Christians? What have we done with our time? What have we done with our talents and gifts? What have we done with our treasures or wealth or whatever God has given us? Have we been good stewards of all that God has given us? Have we lived as witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ? With what motive have we served the Lord Jesus Christ? How was our walk with Jesus Christ here as born-again Christians? Every single thing will be judged here at the judgment seat of Christ. And the result would be either rewards gained or rewards lost. And rewards lost would be a very, very uh, sad thing for born-again Christians because those rewards will determine what quality of life they will enjoy here in the millennial reign of Christ. In the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ and later in eternity as well. So it's important for us to make sure that we are ready to meet the Lord in the air. 
And when we stand before him, knowing the terror of the Lord, Paul says we persuade men. So when we stand before him, we should make sure that we would not be ashamed before him, that we would not have to hang our heads down in shame for not having done what we should do while we lived here on the earth. This is the only chance we have in this life to do something for the Lord Jesus Christ before we are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. So Christians, it's high time we wake up. Wake up and do something for the Lord Jesus Christ. Witness and give the gospel to the unsaved people. Help the poor, be generous, help the needy and do all that you can to not just uh, give them, uh, you know, or supply their physical needs, but also their spiritual needs. Give them the gospel, disciple young Christians, help them to grow in the Lord Jesus Christ. More than anything else, make sure that your own prayer life and your time with the Bible is spent wisely every day. These are things that matter. These are things that will get you rewards in heaven. Obedience to the scriptures, doing the will of God for your life, all these things. So that we would not be ashamed when we stand before the judgment seat of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the first great event in God's calendar. But after that, the Bible talks about this very, very horrible uh, time that is coming upon the earth. And it's called the time of the tribulation. Look at Matthew 24 once again. Matthew 24. And... In, we, we're going to divide Matthew 24 into two parts. Matthew 24 verses 4 uh, through 14 is the first part. And we're going to look at that. And then Matthew 24 verses 15 to 31 would be the second part of uh, you know, the outline which we are going to use to study Matthew 24. In Matthew chapters 24 and verses 4 to 14, the Bible gives us an overview of what is called the beginning of sorrows. The beginning of sorrows are the first part of the tribulation. The first part of the tribulation, which is three and a half years at least. Beginning of sorrows. This would be at least three and a half years and the second part of the tribulation would also be three and a half years now the reason why I'm saying at least well the seven year period of tribulation is certainly three and a half uh, years each divided into th uh, two parts of three and a half years each but there could be another three years before the actual seven years of tribulation begins and after the rapture of the church but that's uh, not something we are going to look at today. Look at Matthew 24 and we'll begin at verse 4. And Jesus tells us what's going to happen in these days of tribulation. Verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. So the first thing Jesus says uh, would characterize the tribulation would be deception once again. Like I've said, this deception has already begun right here in the church age. It's not something that's going to start after the church is raptured. But the deception is already there and is increasing. But you will see it in its full operation in the tribulation. Then in verse 5, Jesus says, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Once again, deception, but this time by false Christs. False Christs. There'll be many false Christs or antichrists in the tribulation. Then in verse 6, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Okay, the Lord is making this very clear. You'll see all these things, but the end is not yet. So the things is, the next one is, Wars and rumors of wars and these are again things that we already witness right now in these last days so that tells you we are very close to the rapture of the church verse 7 for nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers 
places. So not only wars but famines, pestilences which we have already seen, uh, earthquakes in diverse places which have increased greatly in the last uh, hundred years. More than ever before, we are witnessing earthquakes on a very large scale. So wars and famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. In verse 8, Jesus says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. You see this? This is the beginning of sorrows. Deception, false Christ, wars and rumors of wars, famines, pestilences, earthquakes all these are just a foretaste of what is actually going to happen in the second part of the tribulation verse 9 then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake so here in the beginning of sorrows itself you find that there's going to be a great persecution of those who believe in the lord jesus christ let us put it there persecution it begins in the first half of the tribulation itself, but it increases in intensity in the second half of the tribulation. Verse 10, And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. Now you have false prophets. Earlier it was false Christs. Now, there are false prophets mentioned in this passage. Verse 12, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Iniquity shall abound. Because the mystery of iniquity will be there on the earth, the Antichrist. Iniquity shall abound. The love of many shall wax cold. But look at verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. So it says the gospel of the kingdom. Now this gospel of the kingdom is preached in the first half as well as in the second half of the tribulation. In the first half it is preached to Jews. And when they reject uh, this gospel of the kingdom once again it goes to the Gentiles in the second half. Most probably that's how it's going to be when you study the scriptures. But the gospel of the kingdom is not the same as the gospel of the grace of God that we preach today in the church age. The gospel of the kingdom was that same gospel which was preached by John the Baptist when he offered the kingdom to the Jews and said, your Messiah is coming, your King is coming. If you receive him, he will establish the kingdom. And that's what Jesus Christ preached. He preached and said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The gospel of the kingdom is a gospel which offers a the physical, literal Davidic kingdom to the Jews. All right. Uh, and the king of that kingdom is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you and I don't go out and say repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It would mean nothing to the Gentile uh, sinner. We preach Christ crucified. So this is the gospel of the kingdom which is preached in the tribulation. And in the first half as well as in the second half. And uh, this, this gospel will be preached throughout the world. A lot of Christians have taken this verse and have said that uh, before the rapture of the church this gospel will be preached throughout the whole world and only then the rapture will take place they are greatly mistaken and because of this many Christians think oh well the gospel has not really been preached throughout the world to every nation of the world so that means the coming of Christ uh, is going to be delayed there is a lot of time for us before Christ returns for the church. They are completely mistaken. It's nothing to do with the church age gospel. Here we pre uh, preach the gospel of the grace of God. Paul calls this gospel my gospel. And the reason for that, 
Now many preachers don't seem to be able to understand such a basic and simple doctrine in the Bible. Paul calls this gospel my gospel. The reason for that is because the, the, the gospel that would be preached to the Gentiles was revealed to the apostle to the Gentiles, the apostle Paul. Yes, Peter preached to Gentiles before that, but he never understood it properly. He may have understood it properly a little later, but the actual revelation, as you find it in the Pauline epistles, was given only to Paul. Even Peter had to read Paul's epistles and try to understand what God has revealed to him. Why can't Christians understand such a simple thing? Why can't preachers understand it? I can't understand that. But the gospel of the grace of God is preached in the church age, which is to do that is 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 to 4, which talks about the death, burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ for the sins of mankind. That's the gospel we preach here. But the gospel that is preached in the tribulation is the same gospel that was preached by John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. And uh, that was the kingdom offered to Israel by Peter in Acts chapter 2. All these instances are to do with the kingdom, the Davidic kingdom that was promised in the Old Testament to David and to his descendants. And that was also spoken about at the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. The angel said to Mary that God will give him the throne of his father David and he will rule over the house of Jacob forever. It's a literal kingdom. The Davidic a throne is a literal throne. It's not some spiritual throne on which Jesus Christ is sitting right now in heaven and ruling the, uh, the world. Don't fall prey to this uh, childish uh, understanding of the scripture. It's got nothing to do with sound doctrine. Jesus Christ comes back and establishes the Davidic kingdom. The throne of the Lord Jesus Christ is the throne of David. That's what was promised at the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Throne of David. In Luke chapter 1. So you need to clearly see this difference. The gospel of the kingdom is preached. But going back again to Matthew 24, in verse 13 it says, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. This is a verse that is taken by charismatics and others uh, who do not understand the scriptures. And so, uh, you know they take this verse to claim that a born again believers salvation can be lost if they do not endure unto the end. To support this of course they will go to the book of Hebrews and take those passages which, which talk about uh, being faithful to the end. And they say, look, if you're not faithful to the end, you can lose your salvation. Most preachers who preach this, firstly, they don't understand the scriptures. And secondly, it could also be to keep those people in fear so that they could control them. The Bible very clearly teaches that in this church age, people who got saved by trusting the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ will never lose their salvation. Because salvation is a gift that God gives us. It will never be taken away from us. Salvation was not earned by us. We never did anything to receive it. We just trusted in what Jesus Christ did for us. Salvation cannot be lost in this church age. But salvation can be lost in the tribulation. And Jesus says, He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Every time you find the word end here in this book or in Hebrews or in other places in the general epistles, it is always a reference to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is always a reference to the end of the tribulation. Please remember that. It, the end is a reference to the end of the tribulation. He that shall endure unto the end shall be saved. What can happen if you do not endure unto the end? You will lose your salvation. How is that possible, you see? Well, you may profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but works are very important in the tribulation. In the tribulation, no matter what uh, you know, these uh, preachers are preaching nowadays about salvation being the same in the Old Testament, in the church age, in the tribulation, or in millennium, it's not a biblical truth. Salvation was different in the Old Testament. It's uh, going to be different in the tribulation from what, it, from what it is in the church age. Don't get confused. 
because they do not rightly divide the word of truth they do not understand this and they confuse they get confused and come out with doctrines like this that a Christian can lose his salvation because they take a doctrine that belongs to the Old Testament or they take a doctrine that belongs to the church age and apply it to the Christian in the church age that's why they get confused or like these so-called fundamentalists and evangelicals uh, who trust the Greek and Hebrew more than the word of God that was given to us in order to get around these doctrines that are found in Matthew or in Hebrew they go to the Greek and Hebrew and try their best to make it look like God never meant what he said don't fall prey to this other extreme of these people these so-called Hebrew and Greek scholars they are dealing with books that are not inspired scripture so they can never give you the absolute truth you need to go to the King James Bible to get it because this is the final authority for Christians in the last days so what I'm trying to say is that there is a great difference between how people are saved in the church age and in the tribulation the, here in the tribulation salvation is by faith and works you will clearly see it you study the scriptures go and read Matthew 25 what do you see there there is the judgment of nations and uh, Jesus says to the sheep nations uh, that you are very blessed because uh, you know you have given water when I was uh, thirsty you gave me food when I was hungry you gave me shelter when I didn't have a place to sleep you, you clothed me when I was naked works works are all mentioned and because of those works he says to them enter into my rest ye blessed of the Lord it's very clear and to the other uh, group of people who are the goat nations he says depart from me ye cursed into everlasting fire they say why Lord because, again he says the same thing because your works were not there so also in the book of James you see an emphasis on works all that has to do with the tribulation not with the church age salvation in the tribulation is by faith in Jesus Christ and works all right so a person may trust in the Lord Jesus Christ profess faith in Jesus Christ but he would go ahead and take the mark of the beast what's going to happen he has not endured unto the end he shall not be saved that's very simple to understand so Matthew 24 13 where Jesus says he that shall endure unto the end the same shall be saved is not a reference to church age Christians it's not a reference to the end of your life or to the end of the church age it's a clear reference to the end of the tribulation if you endure unto the end you will be saved if you don't and you go and take the mark of the beast then you will lose your salvation that's the first part of the tribulation three and a half years beginning of sorrows and then as I've said in the middle of the tribulation the man child mentioned in Revelation chapter 12 uh, who is uh, brought forth by the woman who is clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet and the stars around her she is Israel now we are not going to go into the details as to the identity of this man child whoever he is going to be he is caught up he is caught up to, uh, to the third heaven in the middle of the tribulation the dragon is there ready to devour the man child a lot of people say it's a reference to Jesus Christ but I do not think that that is likely because if it is a reference to Jesus Christ why is it talking about this event in the future in the tribulation in the middle of the tribulation so it's not most probably not a reference to Jesus Christ it's somebody else a great deliverer of Israel and if you go back and read in the book of Lamentations you will see probably a reference to this man child all right so it's a Jew somebody whom God would uh, uh, use to deliver Israel or do something with Israel and the devil tries to destroy him and he's caught up to meet the Lord in the air I'm sorry he's caught up to go to the third heaven and at uh, immediately after that for the next three and a half years the woman is persecuted by the dragon the woman is Israel and the dragon is the devil and he persecutes Israel for the next three and a half years or the last part of the tribulation now look at verse 15 of Matthew chapter 25 but before we go there I want you to just quickly have a look at Revelation chapter 6 Revelation chapter 6 and we'll just compare the things that are written in Revelation 6 with the things that we have already seen 
Revelation 6 and we'll begin at verse 2. And I saw and behold a white horse and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So you see the white horse. White is the color of peace and the Antichrist comes with peace. That means deception. So you have the white horse rider at the beginning of the tribulation right here in the first part of the tribulation uh, and he brings he tries to bring peace look at uh, Daniel chapter 8 Daniel chapter 8 and we'll read verse 25 Daniel chapter 8 and verse 25 and through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand and he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many he shall also stand up against the prince of princes but he shall be broken without hand so he comes with peace deception he he uh, at the beginning of the tribulation the bible says in daniel 9 he makes a covenant with israel for seven years he offers them a covenant of peace and he deceives Israel into, into believing that probably this man is the much awaited Messiah. But in the middle of the tribulation, he breaks his covenant with Israel. He shows his true colors to the world. But he comes riding on a white horse. The bow uh, is also a very uh, deceptive weapon. You can use it from hiding. You can use it uh, to kill someone without their knowledge. It's not like the sword where you have to face your enemy and then fight him. So he's on a white horse. He's got a bow. It all talks about deception. Now let's go back to Revelation. But before that, okay, let me also show you another passage in the book of Daniel. Look at Daniel chapter 11, verses 21 to 24. And in his estate shall stand up a wild person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. That's what happens in the beginning of the tribulation. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him and shall be broken. Yea, also the prince of the covenant. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. He shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province and he shall do that which his fathers have not done nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and, uh, and riches. Yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. So here you have the Antichrist again coming in peaceably at the beginning of the tribulation in the beginning of sorrows. So deception is the first thing that you must understand that the devil uses even in the tribulation. He comes on a white horse. He comes like a messenger of peace, an apostle of peace, like the Pope, right? He calls himself an apostle of peace. That's a false apostle. He is a false apostle and uh, he is a great type of the Antichrist. Just as the Antichrist comes on a white horse as a messenger of peace, you find the popes doing that all the time. They have been doing that for hundreds of years. The pope behaves like he is the very uh, embodiment of peace, whereas, whereas he is really the devil. That's what the pope is. And uh, that's how the Antichrist comes. He comes like he is a man of peace, a lover of peace. He comes offering peace to Israel. But uh, the Bible already tells us about this deception of the Antichrist. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 6. We'll read verses 3 and 4. Revelation 6, 3 and 4. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. You see this, power was given to him to take peace from the earth. That means the devil 
or the Antichrist came with peace and he offered peace in the first part of the tribulation. But very soon, this peace is taken away, this peace is short-lived and the red horse rider, uh, he is sent to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. So again, we hear about, we talk, uh, we have seen about wars and rumors of wars and things like that. All these things are an indication of the red horse rider. The red horse rider. False cries and deception, the white horse rider. Then look at uh, verses 5 and 6. Verses 5 and 6 of Revelation 6. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. So here you have the third beast, which is a black horse. And the black horse rider brings famine. The black horse rider brings famine. Because a result, a natural result of a war is always famine. Now look at verses 7 and 8. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with the sword, and with hunger, with, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. So all kinds of deaths. So from here onwards, you have... The pale horse. You see, as you come closer to the middle of the tribulation, the pains, you know, the whole period of tribulation is likened to a woman who is pregnant, who is ready to give birth. So the initial pains are called the beginning of sorrows. And then you have the actual birth pains in the second part of the tribulation. As you come to the middle of the tribulation, the, in, the intensity of suffering of the people on the earth keeps increasing. The white horse comes with peace. The red horse talks about wars and killing of each other. The black horse talks about famines and pestilences. And then you have the pale horse, which brings in death in various forms. So what Jesus said is exactly what John is writing in Revelation chapter 6. By the way, in Revelation chapter 6, the four horses bring you to the middle of the tribulation. The fifth seal is open and you see the souls of them that were martyred for Jesus Christ under the altar is the abomination of desolation that takes place in the middle of the tribulation. And we are going to talk about it, the Lord willing, next week. So the book of Revelation chapter 6 perfectly fits in with the things that Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 24. And uh, in Revelation 6, of course, you are taken tribulation. You are given an overview of the entire tribulation. The seal judgments take you through the tribulation ones. But what we have seen today is that in the beginning of sorrows itself, there is much that people are going to suffer. There's going to be deception, there's going to be false cries, wars, famines, earthquakes, persecution, false prophets, iniquity shall abound, love shall wax cold. It's going to be a horrible, horrible time, unimaginable, unimaginable. Praise God, we are going to be caught up before all these things begin. Yes, we do see a foreshadow of all these things already here in these last days of the church. No doubt about that. Yes, we see persecution. We see deception. We see false cries, wars, rumors of wars, famines and pestilences, earthquakes, false prophets, iniquity abounding. All these things are already seen here and that tells you, Christian, that we are very close to the tribulation. And that also tells you that if we are very close to the tribulation, then we are very close or even closer to the rapture of the church. 
I always remember the words of my professor who used to say that we are not only seeing the signs of the times, but we are living in the times of the signs. Those words really stuck in my mind. It's so true. We are not just looking at the, the signs of the times these days. It's true. Yes, we are looking at all the signs that will take place in the tribulation. They have already begun. But we are also living in the times of the signs. These, times are these signs are taking place right now in our time. We are looking at all those things. And that tells you that the rapture is very close. The next great event on God's calendar. The rapture of the church. And then will begin the tribulation. It's a seven year period tribulation. In the first half of the tribulation. These are the things that take place. But we are going to continue the Lord willing next week. And look at what actually takes place in the second part of the tribulation. Before the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christian I want you to pray about this today and say Lord help me to be prepared for the rapture now, I'm not saying that you need to give up everything give up your work and give up all that you do and just wait for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back that would be foolishness I'm not talking about that I'm saying that you get your act together how is your prayer life and how are you spending time with the Bible every day do you give quality time to the Lord Jesus Christ or is it just uh, you know a, a, a very negligible thing in your life whether you pray or not whether you spend time with the Bible or not how is it we are very close to the rapture we need to get our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ right first and foremost then what are we doing for Christ what are we doing for our Lord he saved us he has given us eternal life. He has done everything for us. And he gives us so many good things in this life. But what are we doing for him? And that's a question that you need to ask yourself. And if you're not someone who's uh, born again, if you're somebody who's never trusted Jesus Christ as your savior, let me tell you that very soon we will be gone from this earth. All born again Christians will be gone from this earth. And you will remain on this earth and uh, you will experience the terrible suffering that is coming upon the earth. You would not want to be in this terrible time called the tribulation. You want to be caught up with the, Lord, uh, with the church to meet the Lord Jesus Christ and live with him forever and ever. You say, how is that possible? You must know that you're a sinner. You know it. You know you're a sinner. You know you're worthy of hell. But once you know that, you must also understand that God does not want you to go to hell because of your sins. And God has already done something to save you from your sins. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for your sins. He shed his blood and he paid the penalty for your sins. When he died, he was buried, he rose up again. And you must trust him to be your savior. When you do that, God... You know, there is an exchange that takes place. Your sins and your unrighteousness is uh, imputed to the Lord Jesus Christ and his righteousness is imput uh, imputed to you. Or rather, Jesus Christ comes to live in, you know, inside of you, inside your body. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit if you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. And Jesus Christ is the righteousness of God. So in God's eyes, you would be a righteous man. So whether you die or live at the time of the rapture of the church, you will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and you will live with him forever. Your sins have to be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ before this can ever happen, before you can be a born again Christian. And that happens when you trust Jesus Christ as your savior. When you trust that he did all this for you, that he bore your sins, he, was, uh, he, you know, he suffered, he bled and died for your sins. He was buried and rose up again. If you trust this, you will be saved and you will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And my prayer is that 